All right, I'd like to call the, this uh, work session uh, meeting of the uh, county commissioners to order. Um, we do have uh, uh, several things on the agenda for tonight. Uh, we need to adopt the agenda. Okay. Commissioner, one thing I'd like to add on, on here is uh, uh, talk with um, Commissioner Holbrook uh, just a little while ago. And we want to add on just a, a quick discussion, economic development discussion. We'll put that as number five. We'll work it in, uh, try to work it in before we break uh, today. So. Right. First item we've got on the agenda uh, for our work session is uh, animal control update. We've asked um, Dorothy and Sam to come and talk to us about animal control. So we'll turn it over to y'all for a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Do I need to stand or is it okay if I stand? You're okay to sit right okay. here. Just a little All right. I just wanted to thank all the commissioners for beginning me because we still come with, with problems. And this time we have uh, something good that, that has happened. And you guys help create that. And to show you a comparison, I think you've got a handout. Um, we chose July 2012 through December 2012 to compare to July 2013 to December 2013. And the reason we chose those two time periods is because we hired Jennifer, our adoption rescue person, July 2013. So we wanted to take those six months and compare it to the six months at the same time last year. So we were comparing apples to apples. And, um, She's been employed now for six months, and it's, it's been almost a complete turnaround. As the commissioners know, get, everybody was getting bombarded with all these horrible emails about the animals and the situations that they were living in and us having to euthanize so many. So just to let you see here, um, we've got some numbers. The adoption rate in 2012, 6% uh, of all the animals were adopted. And in 2013, we had an increase of 8% of all animals being adopted. The next one uh, is a huge one with the rescues. Uh, we've had a 38% increase in the number of rescues. In 2012, we had 8% of all animals rescued. In 2013, we had 46% of all animals rescued. And that is a huge jump there, which shows you that um, uh, our rescue adoption person is really doing a fantastic job. She's got a good rapport with all the animal activists in the county as well as um, she's well known in the community. She has a nursing background as well and is familiar with all the diseases that animals carry and can give vaccinations as well, which is a big plus. Um, moving on to the next item, the total number of animals saved in 2012 was 18%. Um, and the total animals saved in 2013 was 59%. So as you see, that is a huge increase. And if you want to break it down farther to look at the number of cats, uh, in 2012, there was 3.5% saved to compare to 2013, 37.5% saved. And then for dogs, uh, the number saved in 2012 was 31%. And then the total number of dogs saved in 2013 was 80%. So you can see a huge increase in the number of animals that were saved. Uh, if we move on down, um, the euthanasia, uh, there was a 42% decrease in the number of animals that we had to euthanize. In 2012, 79% of all the animals were euthanized. Compared to 2013, only 37% of all the animals were euthanized. And then we break it on down to the animals that were uh, euthanized by carbon monoxide. There was a 28% decrease. In 2012, 64% of all the animals were euthanized by carbon monoxide. In comparison to 2013, only 36% of all the animals were euthanized by carbon monoxide. And then if you look at the euthanasia, euthanasia by injection, in 2012 we had a 36% of all animals were euthanized by injection. And then in 2013, 64% of all the animals were euthanized by injection. So as you see, 
uh, we had a goal, a five-year goal, and we surpassed that goal, uh, which was 50% to have the animals euthanized 50% uh, with uh, injection rather than carbon monoxide as a five-year goal, and we've surpassed that already. Dorothea, uh, yeah. the reason why I asked, uh, and I asked to be able to come over here tonight and to present this, because I knew that we were going in the right direction on some of these things. And, um, Hearing you say that in the last six months that we've decreased the use of carbon monoxide by 28%, um, increased the use of lethal ejection by 64%, um, exceeding that goal tremendously. And you know, y'all done a great job with that. Um, it's it's very commendable. Um, my question is, um, with the type of success that we've had reducing the use of gas chamber um, uh, in a very short period of time. Can y'all formulate a, uh, a plan to eliminate the use of the gas chamber altogether um, and uh, you know, we start a countdown the number of days and months so we'll have that gas chamber removed from it. That would go a long way with working with a lot of these organizations uh, to help build more support for them. Sure if I may, I may make a comment, I think, okay, I'm for eliminating the gas chamber. I think if you're putting them at a disadvantage given a day because we're eliminating because we do get wild animals, we get different things that the gas chamber needs to be used for to protect our people. When you say a day countdown and we eliminate it, I think right now you're tying your hand to say, okay, all animals will be disposed of otherwise. When you've got wild animals you've got to take care of, we have aggressive animals that you can't touch. It's more humane to use other methods in the time down. Now, Sam may think different, but, I, you know. I, I just want to take it. Sam, do you got any ideas on that? Or is, there, is there a way of doing this? Well, the there, there's a lot of things that's happened in six months. I mean, thank God we're, we're, we have reversed the number of animals we're euthanized by carbon monoxide and lethal injection. And just took overall the number of animals we're having to euthanize. The staff has really changed. Uh, it's, it's amazing how one individual, uh, as humane and caring as they all are, has changed their their ideas about how they want to keep conducting euthanasia, whether we do carbon monoxide or whether we do gas. One thing that we received about eight months ago was from the wildlife commissioner, the head guy, basically telling animal shelters quit euthanizing all these wild animals. Just because you're trapping them, why are you euthanizing them? It's unnecessary and actually it's illegal. And so with, with that said, in, in talking with Tripp on the wild animal policy that we have, when we trap in wild animals, they're not sick. And, and typically we're dealing with a public health issue with rabies <coughs> and skunks, foxes and raccoons. Well, all this stuff is not rabid. We're just having to catch them more. We're catching them more as a public nuisance than we are because they're sick. A sick animal is not going to go in the trap and eat if it has rabies. So we've recognized that. So we, we are going to have to start going, looking at our policy of maybe catching and releasing it or relocating to fall in line with the memorandum that we got from the head man and the wildlife commission, which you know we, we kind of become friends with those guys. So we want to stay in line with their policy. So. That is still an issue, Johnny, and uh, looking at some other ways of uh, how can you do it other than carbon monoxide, there is methods out there. And so we're kind of like, we're looking at this kind of anyway before yeah, yeah, Commissioner I, I, Falls I, I, asked that. Because yeah. like, my staff is getting to the point too, is like, we don't like using a tank. So it's like, uh -oh. So, you know, we will converse with the staff and work with Dorothea, and I think it's time since we've moved forward, it's time for us to look at all the different uh, policies and procedures on how we do things within the shelter itself. Whether it's euthanasia, whether it's adoption, whether it's space entering, <coughs> you're on the task force and you know, hopefully we can bring something in, in a positive direction to get animals reduced out in the field instead of us having to deal with them. So uh, I think it's time for us to evaluate the whole system. Sure, and I, guess that, I guess that was my comment. My comment was, you know, rather than to pin you down to a tape, you tell us that you want to study it, come back to us and give us a recommendation of what we Well, and, I, and that's, that's, that's really what I'm asking for. What I'm, what I'm asking is, if you can see a way of uh, eliminating the gas 
gas chamber from the animal shelter. I think it would go a long way toward promoting uh, a lot of, uh, of support uh, from a lot of these other organizations, which probably would make your jobs, my opinion, from seeing both sides. And, and we've, I think the sport's always been a big supporter of, of animal shelter. Um, but I think it would go a long way toward making the job easier. Well, Jason, I think we already see the gains that they've made just within six months of what we asked them to do in five years. Sure. And tonight to present that to them and ask them I think is unrealistic because I think that they, they've they already jumped ahead, way ahead of the, of the, of the ball game. And I think in six months with even asking them, they'll be presenting that to us or what they want to do. So I think we, we need to give them give them some breathing room. They, they, they have, they just, with bringing Jennifer on, they have made leaps and bounds um, over at the uh, animal shelter of what they're doing, as you can see. And I think we're going to continue to see that. And that's, uh, and that's in everybody's mind of what they want to do to make the changes over there. And I think we'll continue to see that. So uh, it's, it's not out of anybody's mind of what, what, you're, what you're asking of them. And I think uh, that's, that's right at the forefront. And I think you'll see it from them. And I, don't think you, I, I, think, I don't think you have to ask them for a date. I think they'll come and give it to you. Yeah, and, and, but I think uh, Commissioner Ball's question is more acceptable to us as a staff now seeing how we've done this and that we have the staff that we have. And when I got staff coming to me saying, hey, we don't like this gas chamber. So it, they, it's going to be received very well to try to come up with some type of a plan to be able to eliminate the gas chamber. But we, we, we're, we can handle that now. Six months ago, I just told you, no, there's no way because we were putting down 79% of everything that walked in that door. Now we're not. So that, that's eased up on, on us as a, as a staff as far as the time uh, and, and the basically the mental uh, effect that it has on my staff, euthanizing something in, in, in their own arms. So I think it's more acceptable now, and we definitely will look at all the different programs, Mr. Falls, and come back with you recommendations uh, as we put together the animal control budget, working with Dorothea and Jeff, saying, hey, you know, if we would eliminate a chamber, well, we wouldn't need something to replace that machine instead of the reverse. Normally, machines are replacing people. Now, we may be reversing that and asking for some additional help to, to make this a reality. So we will definitely look at all these uh, programs within the shelter during this, this budget cycle. And the request that I make is not any disrespect to, to what um, uh, the health department or the animal shelter has done. Y'all have done a, a tremendous job. And, um, it, you know, a year ago, I wouldn't have even thought this was even something that we would be talking about now. Uh, you know, we've talked in the past about, you know, some of my concerns and some of your concerns as well. Um, I think with the numbers y'all are showing, um, you know, this, is, this goes into some of the goals that we've got later on. Uh, that the county, the county has set forth or the commissioner has set forth. So, uh, well, we something. are in the minority of having the gas chamber. We're like 11, there's 11 counties left, so it's moving toward that way, <coughs> whether we like to or not. But now that we see that it's possible <coughs> that it could probably happen, I think, you know, eventually that it will. And I do plan to go back to talk with the staff and, and get their support. And, uh, I think that it could probably happen. You know, something that's making this doable more today than it was yesterday is because you guys gave us a position to make this happen. And so, you know, we were being pressured eight, ten months ago, stop the chamber, stop the chamber. Well, they, they needed to give us an opportunity to react to, to what we're dealing with. And by, you know, we came to you guys and said, hey, you give me a position, we'll see how this thing will roll with trying to eliminate so many animals being this <coughs> guys. And we've proved that we can do that. And so I would say within the next six months, we could probably show that again. So uh, you've already given me the first part of the equation to eliminate it. And now, during the budget cycle, I will probably be asking for another part of the equation to uh, be able to eliminate this chamber. I know it's positive part of it is 59% of the animals have been saved in the community, too. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing, like Sam's talking about, <coughs> is the public, the public is, eliminating unwanted animals in the county. I know in talking to Sam, you know, with, with, with contemplating the dog, the cat, I understand, is becoming 
a problem bigger sometimes than the dogs themselves. So in doing eliminating unwanted animals, we're looking at spade and neutering. And if you do spade and neutering, it's going to cost money. So that's what I think Sam alluded to with over the next six months or so, that he's going to come back for a budget. And uh, if we want to complete this task, if you have, then we're going to have to be willing to step forward. And uh, more personnel and more money to do the programs if you want it to hunt. But in order, the the heartaches or the hardship that we, we get from folks out in the community and, and more the humane community, not just the community in general, is, is the carbon monoxide chamber, number one. And then number two was the uh, the, the opening hours. So, you know, we talked to Dorothy, we want to look at the number of hours, how we can extend that and, and, and possibly asking for your help to, to support that. And then the, the other one was to uh, eliminate the drop box that's out in front of the shelter. I mean, we catch it all the time. Why do you do that? Why are you doing that? And so we, we, we hear them, but it's like, give us time to react. And then the, and then the fourth thing would be, uh, and we talked in the task force in length about starting a program to where the animals can come to the shelter. We're talking about pets of people and transport them to Charlotte, have them spayed or neutered, and then bring them back. That's something that we're gonna try to put in this, this uh, budget year cycle as well. Possibly using staff and possibly using volunteers. So we, we kind of got our, we're kind of going in the right direction. So, and, and the beauty of it too, is with me, specifically me and my staff, it's at our pace and, and it's at our wheel and we're not being pressured. So I, I appreciate the request of, of asking us to do that because we are thinking about it. Do you, do you uh, out in the community, do you sense that uh, the people as a whole are, are more in the mindset of controlling animals or do you sense as many rampant animals running on the loose or do you get a feel for that at all? I know you, it's hard to measure, but just... Well, we get our, you know, within the municipalities, in the more populated areas, you, you get more complaints about animals being nuisance and what have you. But out in the county in general, not, not a tremendous amount of anything that would even come close to saying, you know, you've got to keep your animal on your property at all times. We, we're not nowhere near that <coughs> in the, out, in the, out in the county and unincorporated areas. And then some of the municipalities, you know, they contract with us for the municipalities to enforce a leash law, which eliminates a lot of that, but out in the county, that's, we have an ordinance in place now that you guys passed years ago that takes care of those on a per case uh, animal per case uh, basis. So if your animal's creating a problem, we can control your dog by the ordinance that we have today. Any other questions or comments? Thank y'all. Well, we're not we're, 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 we're looking at this other little objection down here that says well, something about improvement. Yeah, so okay. we thought we'd just cover an hour. Okay. You need, you need to introduce your uh, safety coordinator. Okay. Use like. This is Trip Bowen. He is in charge of the animal control area shelter. So we see him back there. Yeah, Trip's out. He's our animal. He's our animal control supervisor. And I always tell this little story about him. He was with the health department as, as a registered sanitarian uh, under the environmental health department. But when things got tight, he he got to come to come work for us. And so uh, he, from a very short period of time, he went from being an officer to be in over the program. So he has a lot of talent, and he, and he is the future of your round control program. And then we have Jennifer Colson. She's our uh, animal rescue adoption person. She's done great. She's done, but I can't say enough great things about what Jennifer has done. Yeah, there, there's a difference in people like an animal and love an animal, and then there's a person you have that has passion. You know, and the word passion to me now with people who love animals has changed because they, she truly has a passion, just like all you guys have it, and, and Commissioner Hawkins as well, that have a passion to uh, to care for animals, and we're lucky that we found her. Well, Jennifer is a guru on Facebook, too. She does a good job spreading the word about not only 
there are up for adoption, but after, they're, after they've been adopted, I saw one today, just about before I came up here, of a family. So, I think it's good to have you over here. Yeah, as I mentioned, Jennifer is a registered nurse, and she started out at the health department in the school health program, working as a nurse. And uh, then she decided to have a child and stay out. So uh, we're glad to get her back in any capacity we can get her back in. But she's proved to be very, very valuable to us in many ways. Okay, I'm going to move on to some areas where uh, we're actively uh, looking at uh, making the, the shelter better and, and trying to improve the program. And one of these is to coordinate a spay neuter transport program with the Humane Society of Charlotte, provide extended hours of operation at the animal shelter, and upgrade animal control software. Um, in order to grow and provide quality care and services, we propose the following capital improvements to the animal shelter for your consideration. In order to upgrade and maintain this aging facility, we believe these improvements should be implemented over the next three years. And as, as always, we do appreciate your continued support and commitment. Um, some of the capital improvements, I think you do have a handout on that. We're looking at between, in 2014 to 2015, uh, put new flooring down to be in compliance with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Uh, installed 64 new gates on the kennels within the animal shelter. Uh, the wall reconstruction to fill in hollow areas to prevent disease growth or any animal excrement that could get into those areas that are not sealed off. And then we moved on to 2015-16, repaint all the walls inside the animal shelter. Uh, replace uh, the ceiling to a product that's a vinyl type material to modernize, improve the appearance and to easily clean the facility. And then lighting, replace all the light fixtures in the animal shelter with waterproof flu fluorescent lights. And then we move on to 2016 and 17 and we're looking maybe to add additional office space to provide adequate room for our continued growth with the staff, public contact, and program management. So those are some of the things that we will be looking for help with. So this is more of a renovation plan uh, for the future because in the past two or three years, you guys have given us a tremendous amount of money to add on to the shelter, <coughs> salary ports, and, and make a tremendous amount of changes to meet the uh, North Carolina Department of Ag rules and regulations when it comes to standards. So we've, we've met those, but we're still dealing with, I like you're dealing with all your buildings, we're dealing with aging buildings. And so uh, we, we definitely need to uh, start taking care of it. And so we're trying to put this over a three year period and uh, try to run it all in together and uh, hopefully working with Jeff uh, on the budget to try to get some additional capital monies to, to do these improvements over a three year period. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Chamber of We are going to pipe this dude that in North Carolina Senate who says he don't, the puppy mill by Bill is dead before they even get there. Who's saying that? Some senators on the Finance Committee says that uh, uh, they're going to be in the puppy mill bill. Yeah. And uh, it's dead on arrival. And so I'm going to start my own little campaign to whatever I need to do. Make sure we put him in a cage and let him keep on himself. So you're going to say his people never touch the ground. So yeah, I don't know. But Ronnie, I'll, I'll do it. We uh, seen on the news where the governor did say that one of his goals for this year was to uh, have that package. And so uh, our, our department, we would support him 100%. We would just like to know who's going to do the enforcement. <laughs> no, I haven't seen that. Senator Obama? Well, he's one of many opinions. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, I would like to say, you know, I appreciate all y'all have done. I, I know that we've been on the task force and some of the work the same has done. That's why I didn't really put him down to a date because I knew that we expect to be steady. You know, and like we talked about some of these uh, emails we're getting. I haven't saw one from North Carolina yet. They're from all all over the world, we get them. It's a, it's a chain letter we get. The people get started. 
we did have a lady the other day was eating lunch. The first thing she wanted to get rid of the gas chamber. We tried to explain to her we were moving in that direction, you know. And uh, appreciate all y'all done. Thank you. We appreciate you too. We couldn't have done it without you. Great job. Send this guy their email. Uh, I think they can get, he can get on their email list. Yep. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll get Jennifer on that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, she did a good job at helping us out the last time we started getting emails. She did good. She did a super job. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, commissioners, uh, I may say this before uh, hand, I'm sure y'all realize this, but we want to be mindful of everybody's time tonight, um, the weather outside. Um, we want to make sure everybody gets home safely. So, um, so we're going to go through this kind of kind of quickly if we can. The next item on the agenda um, is our county manager um, primary budget discussion for uh, fiscal year 14 15. And um, I'm talking to our county manager about this. This is preliminary. Um, we're asking our county manager to make some assumptions. Um, and the discussion can be a lot different when we get closer to the end of the fiscal year, so um, may have to may have to adjust some things. But yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, and I think you did a nice job of of, of uh, teeing this up and getting us ready. I think I think that what I'm trying to do at this point is to is to give you a bit of a, a starting point or a framework uh, for your uh, discussion later this evening where you're going to be looking at your goals and objectives. You've received some updates on uh, staff effort, resource allocation, any progress that we've made, and you're going to be working through uh, a goal discussion with, with uh, priority setting. And I think it's helpful uh, if I can give you a little bit of a backdrop uh, with the help of, I've had three staff heavily involved in this, Chris Kretz, our finance director, Chris Green, our tax assessor, and Al Simone, our human resources director. And I certainly appreciate them being here this afternoon. We want to try to answer any questions that you may have, as well as support staff in the manager's office. Uh, if you look right here uh, at fiscal sustainability focus area, examine efforts to grow tax base through economic development incentive program. And then I think it's also listed over uh, under economic development, Rowe County's tax base strategically to increase jobs locally. Uh, with Chris's help, we went back and looked at the past three years of tax base growth, assessed value, and what we're seeing is we're seeing some, some, some nice growth, especially when you compare that and recognize that we've got a state and national economy that's continuing to climb out of a recession. Uh, you're seeing uh, the economic development partnership that you folks have put together over a number of years, hard work, key collaborative relationships, industrial recruitment, and, and, and your effort is, is working. I would, I would suggest that, that this aggregate growth with, attack, with assessed value is uh, uh, working to, agree, to strategically increase your tax base. You'll see that in 2013, that uh, you, you're at 5.67 with the asterisk, and that is a projected growth uh, number. Uh, at this point, Chris Green would continue to evaluate that halfway through the year, and we're hoping that that trend will continue. I, I, the one thing that I would say about that growth is that this growth does not equate into uh, uh, revenue growth at that level because this does not take into account your economic development incentive grant agreements where uh, as industries uh, uh, follow through and do what is expected uh, with these incentive agreements, we grant back a portion of the tax base for some period of time. This aggregate growth that you see here uh, is gross, not net, and so the net growth is less than that. But over time, commissioners, as you know, these incentive agreements play out, the grant, uh, the grant rebates are, are paid back, and then the full value of the tax base growth goes on the uh, uh, tax rolls, 
and over time this has a payback to the county. So I just brought that to your attention because I think it's discussed in fiscal sustainability and in economic development. Uh, in 2013, last year, uh, when Mr. Deere worked with you to build your budget and Mr. Kreps and, and you put the balance budget on the table, you were looking at approximately $2.8 million in new revenue from the general fund as we, in January, make early uh, uh, revenue projections. We're looking at approximately $2.3 million uh, in new revenue, uh, looking at conservative revenue estimates. Regarding fund balance, unrestricted fund balance, uh, in 2012 you had a 14.1% fund balance. In 2013, I'm pleased to report uh, that through uh, conservative management uh, and an emphasis on growing fund balance, uh, year in close out, you were at 15.6%. I would uh, remind the commissioners that policy guidance is to move unrestricted fund balance into that 18 to 20% uh, mark. And I'm very supportive of that. I want to see us do that over time. And as we go into this budget process, Chris Krebs and I have discussed that as we move, again, looking at a $2.3 million revenue, uh, uh, new money coming in the general fund and wanting to move into the 18 to 20%, what I would suggest is that we take $600,000 right out of the gate uh, and earmark that money to fund balance, re reducing the reliance on fund balance uh, as a uh, uh, balancing strategy. Over the past year, if you'll remember, uh, you allocated $2.1 million of fund balance to balance last year's budget. If we take $600,000 as we go into this budget process, earmark that off the top, that would take that reliance down to approximately uh, $1.7 million. And where I would like to see us go over the next several years is I'd like to get that under a $1 million. I'd like for us to go into our budget process each year uh, with a uh, fund balance appropriation of less than a million dollars. So with the size of our budget, once we get it down under a million, somewhere between 500 and a million, I think you're going to need to see flexibility at that level to where I don't see it as an issue. That, uh, that coupled with a fund balance somewhere in that 18 to 20 percent mark, which is what you previously asked for, I think is a good, sound uh, fiscal management practice if we're able to get there, I'll be very excited. Now, what's challenging about that is that if we do that right out of the gate, if our revenue estimates hold true over the next uh, several months, we're looking at starting a budget process with about $1.7 million of new operating money, okay? And so for tonight, several things uh, that I'd give you to think about, and that may be almost too small for you to see, uh, is that if we start the process with about $1.7 million, in new money, right out of the gate, uh, Allison, Chris Kreps, and I have been looking at our health care fund and the size of our health care fund to be able to continue to provide uh, health and dental to our employees. If we look over the last 12 months, medical inflation is about 8%. So if we roll our health care fund over next year, if we're fortunate enough to take our current health care model, roll it over next year with an 8% inflation number, we're going to need to earmark about $500,000 of new money and, and move that over toward the health care fund. That's a good year. With the size of our health care fund, if we're able to continue to provide it and roll it over with an eight hundred, I mean, with a seven, uh, $500,000 expenditure, again, inflation in, med, in the medical area is about 8%. That's what our experts are telling us. I tell us that we need to just earmark that and sit tight. Regarding employee pay increase consideration, I've had discussions with several commissioners and you, you continue to be concerned about uh, our ability uh, to pay our employees a competitive wage, that we keep up with inflation, and that we provide uh, a competitive uh, uh, wage to our, our employees. 1%, uh, if we were to earmark 1% for next year, that's $360,000 of new money. And so at this point, I'm not recommending anything or suggesting anything. I'm just putting out for your consideration 
that if we're able to do something across the board next year for employees to keep pace to some degree with inflation, general inflation, it's going to be 360000 of new money, and I'm just putting that out as a placeholder right now for us to consider as we move forward. Uh, other things that are unknowns, departments received uh, budget papers and instructions from Chris's department around uh, January the 10th. Uh, budget documents are due back to the finance department March the 10th. So departments are working on budgets as we speak, and they're probably going to continue to work on those for another six weeks, go back and forth on technical adjustments. But really, it's just too early to determine what departments are going to need, what, uh, what increases they will have experienced that are outside of their control, new position requests, uh, and so forth. Finally, I put a $483,000 placeholder in for social services programming. If you'll recall, last year in mid-February, we heard from the state that uh, increases at the social services level last year was almost a half million dollars. That's the uh, fiscal year 13 increase. Uh, Karen Ellis and her team will hear something in about three weeks, and you know I'm hopeful that it will be less than that. But the point in sharing this with you tonight is that, uh, again, I've walked you through how I've how Chris and I have got to an estimate of a potential 1.7 in general fund new revenue. I believe that the 500,000 for medical inflation, we can go ahead and, and, and plan for that. There may be additional adjustments that need to be made on the employer side, depending on how that fund continues to uh, perform between now and the end of the year. I've talked to you a little bit about the cost for uh, base pay increases across the board. Too early to tell what department needs may be, and then I flagged what I think is a big item that's totally out of our control for the most part. To be clear too, on this, on this slide you're not recommending a 1% employee no. pay rate increase. That's no. just to say that 1% no. increase equals 360000 You're exactly so correct. at 2% you multiply it. You're exactly correct. And I appreciate you repeating that out loud because I don't want to be misunderstood that there are no recommendations here tonight. This is just meant to give you the general framework as we move forward to give you a feel for what we're looking at uh, with the resources that we've got. I'm almost finished. One, one question. Oh, yes, sir. I'm, yes, sir. Very good. You got for the department operations and expenses and so forth, what direction do you gave the departments? You know, for example, hold your own, no more, or cut. What justifies new employees? Exactly. What, what directions have been given to the department heads? Department heads have not seen what you have seen this afternoon. I intend, well, well you I'm said sorry. you're working on it, so you should have gave them some instructions for something to go exactly. on. Yes, sir. Chris Kreps and his staff sent the budget work papers out January the 10th, and it would be similar to in the past in sending that out. In terms of giving them the backdrop, though, uh, that was about two weeks ago, and giving them the backdrop that you've seen this evening, this is information that we have worked up probably just in the last seven to ten days. I'll share this with department heads tomorrow, and then we'll be talking about it. Uh, uh, I guess my, way, my question is in the past, when we started approaching the budget, one year we said, okay, we want to cut 2% or we want to hold employees where they're at unless we're really justified. So that's why I'm asking, have you talked to the department head that gave them any instruction? You just said, okay, we're going to give you the information, bring us back the budget. I've not given department heads uh, targets. <coughs> I've not told department heads aggregately to come back with no more than 2% or no, no additional positions. What I've told department heads, and I met with them in January, was any big ticket, anything that would be uh, significant in this year versus last year that I'd like to meet with them and talk to them about that individually. I think that when we take this and pass this to department heads, it's going to give them a framework that they need to understand about how much money aggregately that we've got to work with across the county. And uh, uh, I, I don't know really what to expect from them at this time. I may see some yeah. some. I guess what I'm, what I'm seeing is there's not going to be any extra money. What you're asking is are they looking for any way possible to cut? Yes. Yes. That's what we would be asking. Can we do better 
them. I'm not saying that we can, but I'm saying that's a question I think we need to add. I think it's a speculation. I think one thing to add to the conversation, I think it's yeah. a good point, uh, Mr. Hudson, uh, is this is, we're way in advance of where we normally are. The, the reason for us to look at, and my, I think, we're, <coughs> we're on, the reason why we wanted this brought forward was really to lead us into the discussion on our goals. So we, we have a, a snapshot of where we're at now, the information that we know, um, so that whenever we're looking at these goals, if there's something that's a big ticket item and we see from this that we're going to be, you know, uh, not in a position to do a big ticket item, that might affect where we want to focus our goals on. But I totally agree with what you said. Yeah, yeah but even okay. if it's a big ticket area, the department is already working on something, and we're going to say, okay, you know, we've got to do less or more than are they wasting our time rather than giving us trying to act or we look. I think that what the board can be assured of this evening is that I will work, as well as Chris, uh, we will work diligently with departments between now and March when they submit their final paperwork to determine that they have exhausted opportunities to save money, if there's opportunities to look for uh, combining services, uh, redesigning programs, not filling positions or collapsing positions, re-engineering uh, work processes to save money, uh, to do more with less, we will exhaust that process between now and March. And I think that, that uh, the message that we send there will be consistent and will align well with what we see to be modest growth, but a continuing challenge of paying for uh, uh, things that are getting more expensive, and then you know not having you know, not having money that we need maybe uh, to address some things that departments want needs versus wants. And so I don't want to belabor that, but I, I want to assure you that we'll spend a lot of time with departments on that. I think if I'm a department head. Once you show me those figures, then I'm gonna I'm gonna form some pretty uh, definitive conclusions. One is if I'm expecting to uh, increase some requests, I'm also gonna have to find some cuts to offset, offset that. Good because really, basically, you look at that, you're saying to departmental heads, <coughs> basically, this budget is almost zero increase, it's flat. Uh, so we, if you come in asking for an increase in your budget, there's not money there based on this initial uh, proposal that you're giving to us. So maybe this will help do what yes. Mr. Hutchins is saying. It'll help them form some opinions as to what they got, got to face as they look at those figures because that's that's not what I would have hoped to see, but I guess that's reality right now anyway. Mm -hmm. The let's see. I wanted to take a sec because several commissioners have talked about uh, the fact that the plan has been frozen for some period of time. And uh, what I would, what I wanted to share with the board tonight is that the graph, the, the graph that April put together for me really outlines out of about 760 staff, we've got over 50% that are at step one or two of the pay plan. We've got nine steps in the pay plan. The pay plan is frozen. And as we examine uh, where employees fall in the pay plan, it's important to note that two-thirds of the workforce uh, is between steps one and four. So in theory, if we were to turn the pay plan back on, and it's in theory to ask ourselves the cost uh, of, of reinstating the pay plan as it's currently designed. As you can see, in its current design, steps one and two represent a 4.8% increase, steps three and four a 2.4, a third of the workforce is between step five and nine, and that's, that, that does not go with it automatic step increases. 
but if we were to reinstate the pay plan as it's designed today, you would be looking at approximately uh, $1.7 million to reinstate automatic step increases. And so it's, this is good analysis from Allison and her team in Human Resources. It tells us several things about the age of our workforce, about where they are on the pay plan. Uh, I would argue that we continue to need to watch for uh, uh, retention issues because typically the closer people are to the front of the range, the more apt we are to lose them and the earlier they are in their career. And so you have a, have a higher turnover rate and we continue to monitor that. It's just a, a fact of where we are after several years of having the pay plan frozen uh, due to uh, our inability to afford it. What I would ask for moving forward uh, for tonight, uh, this is early in the process, but I would ask the commissioners to uh, allow the staff to continue to examine our current health care fund design. Uh, Allison and I have been in meetings over the last week with uh, all of our key partners and we're continuing to examine the cost containment strategies both in the short term and the long term. Short term would be changes that we would consider in the upcoming budget process. Long term would be a year out. And I want to have the ability to continue to monitor that. I think that was one of the concerns when I was uh, brought on board back in September is that you uh, explain to me that you'd like to see us take a look at our health care fund and examine cost containment strategies. We're well on our way, and I'd like your support for us to continue to do that. I'd like also, and I emphasize this is long term, and, and that's probably a year, let's take a look at pay plan design alternatives. Let Allison, her staff, uh, uh, folks, maybe we need some outside expert assistance, look at our existing pay plan. I would argue that looking at where we are today, this is probably not affordable in its current design to bring back online anytime soon. And so maybe over the next year, what we do is come back to the board next year at this time and look at some alternatives. What are some alternatives that we can consider with pay plan changes uh, that give us a little better forecast for what we're trying to do with our workforce uh, and our pay strategies? Question on that. I've talked to you about it before, but like the hash depth to two point four something for depth. Could we keep in mind looking say, okay, if this coming year's budget can produce some extra dollars, maybe looking and see instead of a two point four step increase, we go a one point two step increase. Something to that effect if, if any money comes available is maybe modifying it, not going through the, the whole step, but do a modified step if, if money is available. Because I'm like you, you know, with the number of people we checked on this yes, uh, a good while back. That, uh, you know, downstairs and brought it to me. And that, I don't think, I don't think um, government and pay, pay is any different than private and corporate America. Uh, private and corporate America have had to re-examine pay plans and look at alternatives. Uh, I don't know how long our pay plan has been in effect, but I think you probably make a good point. If, if private and corporate America are having to examine yeah. these things, maybe it's time for us to re-examine our pay, our pay scale and pay plan also. I think it's a good idea to look at. Well, I think your point's right in right the bullseye. And uh, uh, the most critical element of the pay plan is that it's affordable. It's the most yeah. critical element of it. And I think Allison and her team over the next year can, can take a look, benchmark, and see what's going on uh, in other areas and, and look at alternatives and keep you up to date as to what we're looking at, keep our workforce up to date uh, so that we know that we're, we're trying to look at what's uh, affordable and effective uh, a year out. I think follow up on what Commissioner Hutchins was saying too, I, I, I think it, you, it has a gigantic impact upon employee morale. <coughs> uh, if employee morale sees that they're going to be fixed because we're basically frozen, 
if they're going to be fixed in one to four for 15 years right. without moving, right. and all of a sudden they start saying, well, maybe I need to start pursuing other opportunities. You know, I'm frozen at a level. I can never get above four unless it's 12 or 15 years from now. So I think it, it, it's sort of a morale thing. It also points out, I think, pretty vividly in your slide, you know, where most of them lie right now. Absolutely. Uh, finally, the third check, and, and I'm not trying to uh, cut, cut comment off. I appreciate the direction, and I certainly appreciate the, the support. The third check would be, and I think it ties with Commissioner Hutchins' comments, and that would be to explore affordable ways to report, reward employees short term. Between now and the, the July 1 uh, budget implementation is for Allison, the staff, and I to continue to look at do we have some affordable ways that strategically that we can um, help our employees uh, uh, with employee pay uh, and bring back for your consideration with the budget. The last thing on policy guidance, and this is moving to the capital side, I've looked at our capital budget, and really the only thing tonight, uh, before I turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, is the Law Enforcement Center Court Services Expansion Project, and it is part of our CIP. I'm prepared to move forward uh, and negotiate with the school system on patent and drive property uh, as a strategic uh, uh, purchase to uh, tie back to our goal of pro prolonging the life of our law enforcement center and courthouse. Uh, I think that the patent and drive property represents about 10,000 square feet of office space uh, with very minor upfits, if any, we can bring that online and we can do that in a strategic way and look at all of the core services that are tied into the law enforcement center uh, and our goal is to expand uh, the space inside the law enforcement center in order to prolong the life of it. And so what I'm asking for tonight, and, and it is in the budget, but for me to be able to move forward would be I've got a placeholder for that property at $500,000 and then I've got a placeholder of $250,000 for necessary renovation. We're exploring what moves make the most sense from a, a, a cost efficiency standpoint. And uh, certainly this would not be the last time the commissioners would hear about this. This would all come back to the commissioners for final review and final approval uh, at the appropriate time. But I'm just asking for your support if, if there's support for me to continue in that uh, uh, analysis and to start discussion with schools. I, I, I would encourage you to do that, just look at, look at the figures. That's what, $50 a square foot? 10,000 square feet. And then to renovate it, and we're going through a building expand program right now with the health department, and we're seeing pretty quickly what the cost of new construction is, Absolutely. far above that, uh, plus, the, plus the location of that facility that yes. sort of ties in with our other government <coughs> facilities there. It does, that's what I've said. It does, it does have multiple uses. It's a, it's a phenomenal piece of property. Uh, it's not just the instructional center, but also the Hunter uh, uh, School oh. Building, which has, uh, we're right now using for uh, some immediate space needs, storage needs. And so uh, our maintenance department is heavily involved in this analysis. And so with your permission, I'd continue to move forward on that. I've actually been looking at that for the last three years, which has not moved in that direction. Right. But I uh, need to put that to rest, either move forward or get it off the table. And that's, that's, that's what I was thinking, too. Now, I don't think you're asking, are you asking for, for us to take, you're not asking for us to take action on this tonight. You're just no. saying that you, you want to continue the discussion. I'd like to continue, oh, yes, sir. I'd like that. <coughs> I wanted to, to talk to you publicly about it, let you know that we're looking at it, and if it's appropriate that I continue, and then at the appropriate time, I come back in a more formal way uh, at, 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 in a, at a formal uh, commissioner meeting uh, and talk to you for that about where we're at with it, what we're looking at in terms of programming the space and what that does for us. Okay? Any other discussion on that problem? No, I, I, I think I'm going to like to move on to tell you. We've looked at it, we've looked at it, and we've got to have it through for a long while for the law enforcement building itself, and this is the cheapest way to go. We do have 
use it for the other buildings and the property go on for the county needs. So, uh, <coughs> that's for them. Yep. We are all in agreement for that. Excellent. Mr. Chair, that's that's everything. And I appreciate your time. I'm certainly, uh, again, Chris, Chris, and Allison, uh, as well as, as, as Carrie and April, been instrumental in pulling this information together. Not trying to cut discussion off, and I know you want to do goal setting, and uh, you're going to get a dinner break at some point. So I'll turn it back over to you, and Carrie is helping to manage our time. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much for all, all your input and help get this uh, lined up. Of course, I know it's a preliminary, so uh, thank you. Um, commissioners, we have three more items. I think two of them are going to be pretty quick. And then uh, the, the main meat of what we're here tonight to discuss is our goals. Uh, if y'all feel comfortable, I think that one of these may just take a, a couple minutes. Carrie, can we wait a minute for we Yeah, I'll work it after okay. Uh, Y'all want to just continue on? We originally said we were going to wait to see it, but we might as well give us a couple minutes more. Okay. I'm trying to reserve the rest of the time to bring it to go. If we can skip ahead to uh, item number four, that's your uh, board training class discussion. I just wanted to bring this up as a, as a point and maybe just have a quick discussion on it. Uh, we don't have to make any decisions tonight, but just wanted to, to bring this out. Um, Currently, we ask everyone that's willing to serve on board a committee to attend the training prior to being appointed. Um, some of those people that we're asking to sit in this class have already served on boards and committees, served in public office. Um, some of the appointments, uh, some of the appointments we do for a board require training after they get on the board um, as well, such as LMEs, um, partners, require should go through a training process, nursing home advisory board. Uh, more extensive process than we have now. And I just wanted to bring it up just for discussion to see if we could, if, if we'd be willing to look at developing a policy so that if someone has either served in an elect, elected capacity before, uh, that they wouldn't be required to go through this board training or if they have had formal training um, uh, and like, uh, I know ethics training is something that, that a lot of different organizations require now. If they could, maybe if they could provide us proof of that training. Um, and, and also another idea is uh, the School of Government offers a module uh, that I looked at this afternoon. It doesn't go in depth, uh, but it is very high level uh, board uh, information that talks about counties and what, what the role of uh, boards and committees are on counties. And that is free. Um, and someone could do that middle of the night uh, just and we can maybe ask for some kind of um, something from them sign saying that they've been through that training and, and take them on that work but these are people that we trust because we're putting them on these boards um, so having them sign something saying they've done it I would think it would be a big issue but um, we've not really talked about this too much uh, formally maybe uh, just in passing on some things but does anybody have any suggestions or ideas or heartburn with us looking at doing something like this? Or, um, Are you suggesting maybe a board training class once a year for everyone to go through that that hasn't been through one? That's, I mean, we could, that's definitely I mean, something we could talk about. Right now, we our current policy is, is that we normally don't appoint someone to a board or committee until they've already been through the training. They'd have to serve. They'd have to go through that training before they could be on the list that we get to appoint people to a committee. But again, some of the committees, like the LME, the School of Government group, provides training for their committee members uh, or their board members that they have to go through, and they have to go through the ethics training. The MPO, same thing, you have to do that on the MPO. I, I think, and I think we have to reform this thing, we were having problems appointing people and they never showed up. Somebody just called here and put their name on the list, is that right, Tony? And they wouldn't show up, so we tried to devise a mechanism and said, okay, at least we got some commitment from them, even though they got other classes of the training. That if you look in the back, like to say to the people that just 
Tristan say, hey, yeah, I like to be on it. The next thing you know, you put them on it. I think we've come up with a better, a better quality of selection. They've got some skin in the game. Yeah, we've got, I, I personally think that we've got a little better hand on it because we have been more fortunate in the appointment because sometimes we've left positions open because we didn't have the people. But yeah, it's whatever, it's whatever the group wants. I know there's different training and I, I, I'd be open to look at it. It's not just a training for every appointment. No, no. And I don't think that you're going to find that either having commission training or not having commission training is going to increase the number of participants that are going to jump out there and going to be on boards. The whole idea that uh, my John was talking about, if you're not willing to commit to a two-hour class, you're not going to give much commitment to the board you serve. And then on top of that, what we were concerned about at the time too was about this here responsibility that they need to know about. It. They need to know that they can go into a meeting and that it's not just what the chairman says. They question. And, the, and what Ann Short is doing is teaching them to question, especially like uh, financial reports. Uh, I won't, I'll go with whatever the board says. I just don't think that uh, you'll be doing yourself a justice by changing the way we're doing it because it's not going to increase the number of people, participants. And if you have to take other training, which I, I do a lot of training, if you have to take other training, simply have to take training for that particular position. But anyway, I'll go with whatever the board says. I think it, it maybe at least at least require them to go through the board training after they, if they're going to go on the board, not say that they have to have gone through the board training before they go on the board. If someone's not going to go on the board training five years before they go on the board, if, if they decide that they, they'd like to they have to show the interest to go on the board, I don't know if that does that suit everyone. If someone chooses to go on the board and they're accepted to go on the board, and they'll within that year or within the first six months that they'll take on the training classes, would that work? That well, it, I mean, if you're going to do that, going to do that while it goes to the house, but you've got to go through other training. That's what you're saying. Okay, well, uh, I mean, you know, with with the sports the LMEs, training, I think kind of you have to, yeah. the LMEs, I think you have to go through. It's either four or six hours training, and you have to sign all kinds of documents and yeah. non-disclosure and things like that. a lot more in depth than what we do. And that you know those those concerns. I, I, I know we have a good class that we that we offer here for boards and committees. I came to the last board and committee training. Um, it was for some of the people that were in the room. It was redundant. We had a we had a city a sitting city council person um, that deals with this stuff on you know on a regular basis um, attending our class. And, and that may be what we just choose to decide to keep doing, and that, if that is, that's fine. But I've had people come to me and say, well, why? Do you, why do you have me do this whenever I've served in this position, or, I've, or I have to go through this other training? Nursing home, like I said, nursing home advisory board, um, after you're appointed, you have to go to Rutherford, um, and you sit in uh, two hours of training there and then leave there and come back and do uh, um, site visits with someone that's training you. And they talk about your responsibility on that on that committee. So that's, it's a, it's a logical question for somebody to ask. And um, I thought it would be a good discussion for us to have. It, and we don't have to make a decision on anything tonight. We can just say, if we want to ask staff to look at options, um, other things that we can, provide or uh, and bring it back at a later time um, that's that's what the discussion was on there for tonight just talking about any other comments on it or concerns everyone okay for to look at options okay. all right thank you uh, all right, we've only got two other things. We'll, if, if it's okay with uh, everyone, we'll go ahead and break, and uh, we'll come back. And
you want to go ahead and do your part now? Okay. Uh, this, this is just for general information. Uh, I, uh, the county has been notified that we are uh, a finalist for an economic development project. Uh, that project is down to three sites. Uh, North Carolina, which is Eagle County, is the site. South Carolina and Tennessee. Um, I want to really underscore two, two things. One is um, you either compete or you lose in the day of development, which we all know and understand. Uh, I want to brag on the commissioners by saying this. Number one, that we struggle like all get out to land in the hotel. And finally, the commissioner said, well, we're going to do something creative and visionary and put that in front of a couple of hotel for a drop dead sunset date, see if we get a response. And all of a sudden, the two that we've been working on made decisions. Uh, so I, I think the fruit's in the pudding there. I'm saying that to say this, this project uh, has uh, up toward a couple hundred jobs. The project also has the potential of a relocation of a distribution center. Uh, the project uh, pay scale, thousand dollars above our average pay scale in the county. So it meets a lot of the things we like blue collar, manufacturing, uh, automotive relay, which we've trying to, been trying to attract that niche. Um, I'm going to go down a separate road just a second. I don't know how many of you watched the news yesterday. Black and Decker wanting to relocate back into Charlotte. I thought that was a pretty neat term. We use the term outsource so often. They're, they're using the term insource because Black and Decker are wanting to come back from Mexico to Charlotte for a project not nearly as large as the one I'm talking about. The average pay is Charlotte's 45000 Mecklenburg $45,000 a year. This, which is 10 above our county, this particular project, Black & Decker, is in print, so I'm not revealing anything confidentially. Uh, average pay was $29,000, $16,000 it. And it violated principles that they had set aside in their economic development incentive packages. I thought it was pretty amazing last night. Well, I'm looking at the news and listening to the news, and those commissioners that were interviewed and questioned, why will you consider this? And it was, quote, this is all about jobs. Our people need jobs. That's Mecklenburg County, Charlotte, saying that. So I, I, I think it really, it really sort of charged me last night when I heard all this because I had been to an economic development meeting, okay, our local board, and there was a, and I talked to our economic development people, and the number of economic development group projects are reducing in number because of the state reorganization and uncertainty in how they're going to go about economic development. So the prospects are, are dropping while that uncertainty lies out there. And I didn't, you know as much as I do how I feel about economic development. But I, I think I would like to urge our board to go on record and say to them, hey, this is a project this county needs bad. I mean, it's multiple hundred jobs, potentially. The, 
pay is there. The benefits are there. It's a niche that we've been trying to work to get. You don't need to float the normal incentive package out there. This is too, this is too attractive for us to do that. Plus, as a board of commissioners saying, say to them if it's satisfactory to do so. This thing means a lot to this county. Our charge to you will be, you need to really examine the package very closely, be even more visionary than you have in the past, and see what our chances are. But we know without any question what South Carolina and Tennessee are going to do. We don't know the numbers, but we know they're going to be challenged. So uh, I, I just want our board to give our economic development people a little, a, a, a vote of, not a vote, a supportive uh, suggestion, change gears on this project. And let's, let's see if we can be a little bit more creative than we normally are, a little bit more visionary than we normally are. Because this, this, this thing is, is tailor-made almost for our, our people. And we don't, need, we don't need to get out done with South Carolina or Tennessee on this deal. I think you probably made this statement before, and you probably make it a lot better than I can make it. The thing I always like to try to tell people, it doesn't seem like most of them tend to understand that any job that you can bring, whatever amount that is being paid, is a lot, lot, sometimes better than a lot of jobs people have. And the thing about it is, if you give them that incentive uh, to come, uh, if they choose not to come, You've got nothing in the future. If you do give them an incentive for whatever number of years, at least eventually, if they become good corporate citizens of Cleveland County, they will begin to pay it back. But if, if, you, if you mess around and don't give them the incentive that they need to make it, you, we have not, we've not made anything. We're not lost, but we will eventually. I just don't understand why people don't understand that, but I just uh, have a big problem with um, people wanting to quote put price tags on jobs when it's better working than the job. I'll tell you that. And plus, if you get the benefits and everything. Well, I know there have been some question and concern about, from some of you about well, what's going on economic development. Well, I'd like to say I can tell you everything. I can't always tell you everything because of confidentiality. But I felt like you needed to know about this. Yeah. Uh, just, just kind of like a, I don't think we've got a standard tax. We don't. We've, we've chosen to step out of the box. And it's the driving force, like you say, is what is tailored to our area. We need to step out of the box and go after it. It's more it's telling us all the details Visitors had decided in the past we don't need to know the details. We don't need to know the name, we don't know the need specifics because jobs and projects have been lost on account of lease. So that's why we chose several years ago that that's why you're charged with the job you got. Our economic development team got it, the county managers got it, what you informed us that it is a good job. <coughs> It would be my recommendation that we go after it. I'm like Commissioner you know, Hawking, 100 percent nothing, nothing. But if we can land these people jobs a thousand dollars above their average wage, that's going to put them in the thirty thousand dollar bracket above. It's going to put them benefit. That's better than McDonald's. And like you say, with the city packs we've got, we go it. They become good corporate citizens. That helps their retail. That helps everything else. And uh, I'd say my suggestion, like Mr. Hawkins, is, hey, let's do what we need to do if we can land it. Well, I think the county manager and I need to sort of convey that word over to the people who are leading part of this charge. Any other comments? 
I think our economic development group has done a good job of putting packages, uh, creative packages together of the value of our community and the, the, the life and the community college and the training programs and the things that they can bring to put, in, to put in those packages that has brought them so many new businesses, businesses and industries. From what I've hearing from this discussion is they, I, I think we're all in agreement that we would want to do everything we can to do to attract quality jobs here and um, uh, if it means being aggressive then we need to be aggressive on them. We've got a lot of great employers in our county and not, not knocking the McDonald's jobs. Those are good well, jobs too. I, 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 I know what you're saying. I, I understand what you're saying. I totally understand what you're saying. My first job was was uh, the Burger King here in Shelby, so I can put that in the band. It's just a good place. Anyway, there's nothing else on that. If we, uh, we've we only got one item left, but that's our, that's our goal discussion. So how long do y'all feel comfortable with a break for, for having a cup of soup? An hour? No. Be back in here at 7 o'clock. I don't want to get bothered too long. You want to say, uh, how about a quarter minute? Okay. Okay. Quarter minute, would that be good? Don't want me to say anything. How about 10 to you? Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can be down to the quarter two. Okay, and if we, if we can't be here toward the we'll work on from there. Because I'm going to head up there. I had three wrecks on the way over here. Hey, you can down to the heel of the There's, we'll get one in check.